Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Lovely to have so many of us here on this chilly morning and wonderful to have the faithful remnant of the choir who have chosen not to go to England to stay and serve us. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to tell you this morning a little bit about a friend of mine that I used to work with at my old church. Uh, he was older than I am, and he had a fair few decades of life experience on me. Uh, he used to be a high school maths teacher, and then he became a school principal. And in his semi-retirement, he decided to come and serve the church. He had a saying that he would repeat, whenever things didn't quite go the way he planned, which in church work is more often than you would like. He would say... If you have no expectations of people, then you are never disappointed. But you can still be happily surprised. Now, you might think this is a cynical way of looking at the world, but for him, it was the total of his experience of decades of working with people. The expectations that you set for other people, whether you voice them or not, are often not met. People will let you down. The great thing about working at a church is that you get to see time and time again how often God blows your expectations out of the water. God never lets you down. Now, in our passage today, we have two encounters that we're going to look at in which Jesus does things that don't match up to the expectations of those around him. These encounters aren't related, but we will see how Jesus continues to do these unexpected things. And we begin with our first encounter. Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd come to a town called Nain. Now Nain, at the bottom of the map there, Nain is a very small town. Probably only a few hundred people live there. And as they arrive, they come across a funeral procession. A woman who was already a widow has now lost her only son. And this is important information because we now know that she has no family left to support her. And while most of the town is with her in this moment, we're meant to recognise that she is now alone. In this moment, Jesus sees not only the pain she has from losing her son, but also the difficult position that she will be in for the rest of her life. And Jesus' heart goes out to her. He feels for her. And in his compassion, he decides to act. Now, note that Jesus hasn't been talked to by anyone. No one's even recognised who he is. No one's come running over to him, begging to to do something to help this widow. He sees her position. He grieves with her. And he decides to act. And all it takes is a few words from Jesus' lips. And the son sits up and begins to talk. What an amazing miracle. But what does this story tell us about Jesus? Well, it tells us that he has a desire to heal even when he isn't asked to. There are no expectations on Jesus in this moment. Unlike the previous chapters where we've seen people coming to Jesus just to touch him so they will be healed. Such were the powers coming off him. In this moment... A grieving widow happens to be in the right place at the right time. And Jesus acts out of compassion and love. And there's no mention of faith here either. This is all out of God's love and mercy through Jesus. And what do the crowd recognise in this moment? Well, that God has come to help his people. And though they haven't recognised Jesus as a Messiah, they are right. God has come to help his people. But it's not in the way that they are expecting. 
Our second encounter is quite different from the first. It revolves around John the Baptist. And John is seeking confirmation that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, John has already baptised Jesus by this point, and he's seen heaven split open and the Spirit descending on Jesus as a dove. And he's heard the voice of God from heaven saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. But John is human, like the rest of us. And so he wants to hear it from Jesus' lips too. Now, I don't think that he is doubting But he knows that his job is to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. He wants to make sure that he's got it right in Jesus and that he shouldn't be waiting for someone else to come along. I can understand where John is coming from in this. Jesus' response to John's question isn't as clear as he would have wanted, but it does tell him everything that he needs to know. Jesus says this in verses 22 and 23. Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, that very last sentence is the important one. Jesus is not going to lead John astray by letting him think that he's not the Messiah. He is showing everyone through what he is doing that he is God. And so John doesn't need to worry or wait for someone else. Jesus is the one whom he has been preparing the way for. John has done his job and he's done it well. But what happens after John's disciples leave is of greater interest to us. Jesus begins to speak to the crowd about John and the purpose that John served. John was a prophet, a great prophet, the last prophet who spoke of the Messiah that was to come. And many people recognize this in John and that's why so many of them went out into the wilderness to see him. And so Jesus asked them, in verses 24 to 27, repeatedly, what they went out to see. And I love his answers because sometimes he's he's a little bit cheeky with his answers. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Well, why would anybody go out into the wilderness to see a reed swayed by the wind? Well, if not, What did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. And he's right. John was not a man dressed in fine clothes. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And unlike a man who would indulge in luxury, John ate locusts and wild honey. Were these local delicacies? No, not at all. It was what was available to John in the wilderness. And if you've ever eaten a grasshopper or a locust, you know it's not what you want to eat every meal. I mean, they're not, they're not that nice. They're not bad. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet... This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. They went to see the one who was preparing the way for the Messiah. The one who would point them to him. I mean, that's worth a trip to the wilderness, isn't it? But then the unexpected happens in verse 28. Jesus says, I tell you, Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So Jesus says, there is no one greater than John. And then he says, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is affirming two truths at the same time. First, John is great. Jesus says that no human up to that point had been greater. John towers over history as an example of what it looks like to live a life pleasing to God. Second, the least believer in the new covenant era is greater than John. John stands at the pinnacle of all that came before Jesus. But he only prepared the way for what we get to enjoy. Like Moses, he didn't enter into it himself. We, on the other hand, get to enjoy greater blessings. We have experienced more of God's grace than John ever did. The unexpected truth here from Jesus is that the great prophet that all the crowd went out into the wilderness to see, and while he was great and he was blessed, John did not experience the same blessing as those who had witnessed Jesus' death and resurrection will have. And all those who have come after John have a greater blessing than he ever did. We have the full arc of God's salvation history. We know the full story and we can come to God in a way that John never could. But does this mean that John will be the lowest in heaven? Well, no, it doesn't. And the verse doesn't imply that there is a ranking system in heaven either. All Jesus is trying to show is that Though John was a great prophet on earth, none greater. Those who are in the kingdom of God are greater than any earthly prophet could be. And so John the Baptist will join with all those in the kingdom. But to a crowd of people following Jesus around, he has just told them that if they believe and have faith, they will have something that John the Baptist never did in his life. Now, no one would ever have expected Jesus to say that. So what do we do with these encounters? Well, we can see in both of these encounters with Jesus that the expectations of people were far exceeded, but in really different ways. The widow had no expectations And Jesus raised her son to life. And those who viewed John as a great prophet, Jesus now tells them that everyone who comes after him will be greater. So it seems as though we should be asking ourselves a question. What do you expect of God? When you think of what God is doing in your life and your current situation, what are the things you're expecting God to do? Maybe the better question is, are you expecting God to do anything? Perhaps your life experience is that God isn't really doing anything at all. Or maybe you can look and see that God has done an awful lot for you. And it is, in some sense, a subjective assessment. But you may be someone who no longer has faith that God will do something in your life. And so you have no expectations. I think we've actually got the question wrong. Instead of asking, what do you expect of God? It's actually better to ask, what should you expect God to do? What are the things that we know that God has promised to do? What are the expectations that God has set out that we can hold on to, that we know to be true? Well, there are some things that we can expect God to be doing for us if we continue our relationship with him in faith. We can expect that God will strengthen us in hard times. We can expect that God will meet our needs, though not always in the area that we feel are needs. God will continue to answer our prayers and keep working out everything for our good. God will continue to be with us and protect us when we are under attack. But above all, the biggest expectation that we have of God is that he will keep his promises to us. 
that we will have eternal life with him, eternal rest with him, and that nothing will ever separate us from him and his love. There are over 3,000 promises in Scripture from God to his people, and he will keep every single one. And so I encourage you all to think about what do you expect from God? Do you expect him to do the things that I've just mentioned? Or do you expect to do some of those things by yourself? Do you look to God for all your needs, for strength, for protection? Or do you place that expectation on your own shoulders? Let me finish with these verses from Ephesians 3. And I encourage you to ask more of God and expect him to hold up his end of the deal. He wants you to come to him when you are in need, when you are hurting and suffering, and when you are lonely. God is there for you. So hear these words of comfort from God and start to expect more of him. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you that you are the God who exceeds our expectations, who will never let us down, and who will keep every promise you have made to us. Thank you for always being there for us, providing for us, and sustaining us. Lord, please remove from us any sense of pride that stops us from coming to you and allow us to put all our trust and faith in you and your provision. Lord, help us to trust you and in your ability to do more than we could ever expect. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.